A word from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham read to the, ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Did Abraham know that it was the Lord who was visiting him? No? I see some folks saying no. Anybody think that he did? There, possibly. I see some, some heads nodding yes. It's hard to say. The scripture tells us from the very beginning, right? The very first verse of chapter 18 of Genesis says, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks, right? So we know from the very beginning who this is. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to assume that Abraham knows as well. And yet, we don't know whether or not Abraham knows. We know that this isn't the Lord physically, because uh, the tradition tells us that the only one who has ever viewed the Lord, the only one who has ever viewed God uh, 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 firsthand, with the exception of Adam and Eve in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the garden, um, is Moses. And even Moses could only look at God's back as God passed, right? Nobody can look upon God. Plus, we know that these are three people, three strangers, three people who visit. So this isn't, it's not as though uh, uh, it was obvious that God showed up, but the Lord showed up in, in the visage of three people. And the scripture goes on to say that uh, Abraham responds in such a way that we would like to think, I would like to think, I would respond if I saw God uh, walking by my tent or my home, right? Immediately um, humbles himself, asks, hey, don't pass me by. He says, Lord, don't pass me by. And you might think that that's the key right there, the, 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 uh, the, the, the thing that makes this obvious, right? That, that Abraham responds by saying, uh, Lord, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. But uh, this may be something that you wouldn't notice if you didn't do a careful reading. And even if you did, uh, if you didn't uh, spend three years of your life in seminary, you may not know why, uh, what this means. So that's why you have me. Um, in your Bibles, you may notice sometimes as you're reading, especially in the Hebrew Bible, um, that sometimes the word Lord is spelled in what we call small caps. The first, word, the first letter L is, is a capital L, but then the O-R-D is in uh, smaller letters, but they're still capitals. Have you ever noticed that? If you haven't yet, you will the next time you go read your scripture, which I'm sure is every hour on the hour, like, uh, like we all do, right? But next time you go read, now that you've heard this, you won't be able to unsee it. Uh, when uh, you see that in scripture... That version of Lord is a translation of the Hebrew Yahweh, which actually in the Hebrew wouldn't have vowels in it, 
Um, you can't speak the name of God in the Hebrew tradition, and it's really just uh, our way of saying the, the words, the answer that God gave to Moses when Moses saw the burning bush, and God said, go tell them, uh, uh, tell Pharaoh to set my people free, and, and, God, and Moses says, who shall I tell them is sending me? And we get that answer, uh, I am who I am, or I am who I've always been, or I am who I will be. All of those are acceptable answers on the test. Um, uh, the, the actual answer, the literal translation is yah he just three or four letters in the Hebrew language, which we translate to uh, Y-H-W-H or Yahweh. And so if you see that, that lowercase uh, or that lower capital, the small caps, Lord, that is the Hebrew Yahweh. So that's telling us from the beginning that this is God, uh, uh, the name of God. So God appears to Abraham by the oaks as he sat at the entrance of his tent. But when Abraham speaks to them and he says, my Lord, that is no capital letters. The Hebrew translation of that word is Aaron, which we often hear as uh, Adonai, which is what we'll, hear, we'll use later for Jesus when, we, when people call Jesus Lord of Lords. It's just a common usage of the word master. And so this is not uh, uh, Abraham addressing God as God. He's not saying, God, don't pass me by. He's saying he's humbling himself, even though he's at his home, and these are strangers walking by, he's in the role of a servant and saying, Master, if I don't pass me by, allow me to provide hospitality for you. So, does Abraham know that it is the Lord? The correct answer is no and yes. This is the beginning of of establishing a theme that will run throughout Scripture. That in the Hebrew Bible, whether it is in Genesis from the very beginning right here, to the law later on, to the prophets after that, to the words of Jesus, God is in the least and the lowest among you. When you see somebody in need... It's not just a good idea to help them out. That is God in your midst. And it begins from this idea that we repeat over and over and over again. Uh, you, you hear it repeated, this idea of uh, uh, care for the stranger in your midst, for you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. This is part of Abraham and Sarah's story. Prior to this, prior to having uh, this place where they have established themselves, now they are the lords of their own uh, a, a town, city, um, they were wandering through the desert as God had called them out of their home place, and they had to beg for kindness and for care and mercy, especially in Egypt from Pharaoh. And God reminds them often, just as you needed help, so you must help others. Just as I helped you through others showing you mercy, so you must help others that I send to you. And so this is just the beginning of an ethic, of an ethos that will run throughout all of Scripture that we need to know. We need to know these things from the beginning because they provide context for everything else that will come. The idea that this is not obvious to Abraham, that this is God, and yet Abraham knows instinctively that any time a stranger shows up at his door, it is God. And so he doesn't just provide basic... There's a, I believe that um, there is always a universal and a particular reading of almost any scripture. The particular being, this is a story that happens in a particular place, in a particular time. And we know that the particular place in which this happens, the, the world, uh, uh, the geographical space, what we now call the, the Middle East, often uh, we refer to it, this is a desert space, right? I come from a desert, different desert, but I come from a desert as well. 
And there's a particularity to the fact that uh, this is a desert, and in the desert, particularly, wanderers need shade and water. Those are just basic human needs, necessities. But there's a universality to this story that reminds us that when we see wanderers around us, there are basic human needs that, 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 they, that they have that we just need to meet. And so uh, uh, Abraham knows this, and so he says, don't pass by, allow me to provide you shade and water. And not just water, but let me just, not, not just give you water to drink, which would be like the basic human thing to do, let me take some of my water and use it to wash your feet. That is both an extravagant use of water in the desert and a humbling act which we will later see uh, mirrored by whom? Who? Oh, yes, I knew you knew that. I, it's just going to take a while before you know that I'm not just asking rhetorical questions. You got this. You're right. You know the answers, right? Okay, good. Jesus. Jesus will do this later on as a way of reminding his disciples that the greatest among us must be servants of all, right? So even though uh, uh, Abraham is the master of this space in which these wanderers have come, and he could be commanding others to do these things. He humbles himself because this is just the beginning of a story in which we are being introduced to this idea that the greatest among us must be the servants of all. And so once they agree to this, to a little bit of shade and some water and maybe some bread, he doesn't stop there. While Sarah is making the cakes, he goes and takes a good calf, not just any calf, but a good, one of his choice calves, has his servants prepare that, takes it out to these folks, provides them meat and cheese and bread, and stands by while they eat. This is not just hospitality in, its, in a minor form in the desert. This is extravagant hospitality. This is how we treat God when God shows up in our midst. And how do you know when the strangers who show up in your midst are God? The answer is, you never do. The answer is, you always do. The answer is, they always are. This is where our scripture is a wisdom text that reminds us that it is more than just a story about a particular person who did a particular thing at a particular time. This is a story that is, that is meant to set the stage for all those who will follow God from now on that there are times when we will be the strangers wandering and we trust that God will provide not always what we want, not always the, the mansion on the hill that we want, but the water and the shade that we need when we humble ourselves enough to ask. And in turn, when co folks come to us in need, even before they ask, we offer. In September, we're going to continue a, a, a tradition that has been here at Broadway for a number of years. Uh, we're going to celebrate coming home month. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate kicking off, uh, uh, relaunching some of the ministries that have been hi on hiatus over the summer. Welcome back the folks who have been on vacation uh, uh, throughout the year. Um, celebrate the, the beginning of our, uh, our Wednesday evening activities, although uh, uh, you might have to remind Shane and the youth that our Wednesday evening activities took a vacation because they've been, they've been going strong. Uh, uh, but a lot of our, our Bible study, our Wednesday Bible study, our dinners, uh, um, some of our, our children's ministries, some of the, the things that you know better than I do because I haven't been here for them yet, our, our, uh, our choir and our bell choir, um, we're going to do a blessing of the backpacks during September and so we can uh, celebrate the, our students going back to school, especially you parents out there are celebrating our kids going back to school, I know. Um, not me, but some of you parents. Uh, uh, we're going to um, uh, we're gonna take a moment to, to celebrate 
the folks from St. Mark's to celebrate the ministry of St. Mark's, which closed uh, later, or earlier this year, and celebrate those whose, uh, whose uh, uh, memberships were transferred here. We're going to take the opportunity to celebrate all the folks who, have co- who are coming home, coming back to this place uh, uh, after a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe a couple of years of taking time off. We're going to welcome everybody back. And as we do that, we are going to celebrate the coming home of all the people who have never even been here before, but for whom this is a home. Because when this church was built 175 years ago, it was put here to be a spiritual home for anybody in Council Bluffs and the surrounding areas who needed to find a place of respite, a place of hospitality, a home when they were wandering in the spiritual deserts that we all encounter from time to time. So as we prepare for that coming home uh, month in September, we're going to spend August talking about what hospitality, radical hospitality looks like. And I invite you to be in prayer about that. What are the things you can do? You don't have to do it all, but if everybody does a little something, maybe it's sprucing up the place a little bit, a little spring cleaning in the middle of August, maybe it's uh, uh, thinking about how you can um, uh, welcome people more intentionally or um, or how you would like to help provide opportunities of growth and ministry for folks. I don't know. I'm still praying about it and thinking about it. I hope you will, invite, you will join me in that prayer and consideration. Together, we are going to spend August preparing ourselves to offer radical hospitality to everybody who joins us in September and really for the next 10, 15, 20 years that I'm here and beyond. Amen.